won't perish. Right. Believe on what? What he revealed about the Father. What he revealed about God being his Father. What he revealed about God being the Father of mankind. And I, I agree with you, Annette. Our, uh, our linear brains, our circularly reasoning brains, our 2D brains struggle to wrap our heads around three and one, or separate but one. I mean, when it talks about Emmanuel coming to the earth, it calls him everlasting father. Yeah. It calls Jesus everlasting father, mm -hmm. prince of peace, wonderful counselor, right? It calls him that, right? And I think when, at the end, when we're standing there and we, we see God with our, you know, when we see God, not right. just like through faith or in our hearts, we'll see you Jesus, to get it? right? And yeah, we'll see like how it is all one. It'll make sense then to people. But yeah, that's what it means to, to believe on, on Jesus. And I, I love what it says in 2 Corinthians 3. It says that there was a veil on their hearts when they read Moses. And then it says, in Jesus, the veil is removed. And then it says, they're still reading Moses as if the veil is there. So what it's saying there is, is that they were always reading Moses wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And then they did when Jesus came... They didn't see the veil removed from Moses and then see what Moses was actually always saying. Mm -hmm. They continued to read it through a veil. When you see Jesus, you're not supposed to come to this place where you say, oh, well, Moses was saying something contradictory to Jesus. Yeah. And then Jesus came and said this. We have the old and we have, and we do have the old and the new. I'm, I'm talking about the understanding of what that means. But they saw the two as being separate. And so what Paul's saying there is that Moses was always talking the same language that Jesus was talking. But we had a veil over our hearts. And then Jesus comes, and in Jesus the veil can be removed, and then we can look back and see what Moses was actually talking about the whole time and see it accurately. For instance, when I first got into grace, and I, the only way I could compartmentalize that was, well, we were on the old covenant then, and we're in the new covenant now. And so God was dealing with us this way then, and he's dealing with us this way now. That was the best way... I could come and describe it. But now that I look back on it, I was still reading Moses through a veil. And I wasn't seeing what Moses actually said. When I got to the blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30, I thought it was all about if you perform the works of the law, you'll be blessed. And I thought that it was about God wanting us to earn blessings by performing the works of the law. And if we didn't perform the works of the law, if we didn't perform the thou shalt, then he was going to curse us. And I thought that's how God was then. And that's what he wanted out of the thin. But now it's something different. Now we don't have... But when I go back and look at that, now that made no sense. Because Deuteronomy was about how the children of Israel were going to inherit... Notice the words I'm using carefully. Inherit the promised land. Inherit the promised land. Now, how do you inherit something? Do you perform works to get it? What about a promise? Do you perform works to get a promise? No. No, in fact, Paul would come and say, you make the promise void if you try to inherit it by your works. So the whole point of Deuteronomy was God telling them through Moses how they were going to inherit the promise. Now, the only way you can inherit something that someone's promised you is by just receiving it as a gift. And so all of Deuteronomy was talking about them inheriting the land as a gift from God, not by their works. But I was always reading it through a veil, right? I mean, does everybody agree it's called the promised land? Does everybody agree that Deuteronomy is telling the children of Israel how they can get into the land and not perish from off of the land? Well, it's called the promised land. Well, do we all agree that Paul said you make the promise void by trying to work to get it? Okay, so then how can Deuteronomy be talking about being blessed by performing the works of the law? It can't be. The works of the law were actually talking about the work of God. And the only reason why you would do the works of the law is to come together and talk about the work of God. And so it was by promise. And so I was still reading the whole Old Testament with the veil over my heart, even when I was in grace for over a decade. Because I didn't see that the word was always grace. The word was always grace-filled. It's just we had a veil over our hearts, so we couldn't see it. And then the veil's removed in Christ. And then you start seeing Deuteronomy for what it's really talking about. I used to think, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I used to think God demanded that from us. But we couldn't do it. And so we don't have to do it anymore. Jesus did it for us. Well, And now I go back and read Deuteronomy, and I'm like, wait a second. The way you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, 
is by resting in his work to give you life as a gift. I have done that. I am doing that today. He defines what it means to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he doesn't tell you it's by you performing the works of the law. He doesn't tell you it's by you performing thou shalt. He says the way that you do it is by not having any other gods. What are gods? Things you made with your own hands. The way you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength is you don't worship your own works as the means by which you're going to have life. You rest in the work of God. That's how you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. It doesn't mean go off and do everything right. It doesn't mean you got to go build a big ministry. It doesn't mean you got to serve in the church, although we may do some of those things. But that's got nothing to do with loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Moses went on to say, he's a jealous God, for God is a jealous God. What does that mean? It means he's, bur he's got a burning in his bones for your life. Your life is precious to him, and he's jealous over your life. He knows that no one can give you life except for him. And so he doesn't want you making gods with your hands or trying to give yourself peace and love and joy with your own ability because he knows that can't give you life. And so he's jealous over your life. He knows he's the only one that can give you peace. So he doesn't want you going after things that can't give you peace because he doesn't want you to be hurt. <clears throat> right? And that's how you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You come to God and you say, listen, man, I need peace and I don't have it. And I'm not able to give it to myself. I need joy and it's absent right now. And I can't give it to myself. That's how you, you're busy loving God. When you come and say that, blessed are the poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? You come to the place where you say, Lord, I can't give myself peace, love, joy. I can't persuade my heart that I'm acceptable, that I'm good. I can't do any of that. I need you to do it. That's loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Blessed are the meek. Those that adopt the word God spoken about their life instead of trying to build a word about their life through their own works. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble. Who are the humble? Those that adopt God's opinion of them instead of trying to build an opinion for themselves. Right? That's what, that's what it means. See, but for the first 10 years of my grace life, I, I, I compartmentalized all that. Oh, well, that was then. And this is what he demanded from us then. But it's different now. See, I still had a veil. And what grace is supposed to do is remove the veil so you look back at the Old Testament and see that it was always full of grace. And then you start seeing the grace everywhere. And then you're just busy preaching that like gangbusters, which is what Jesus preached, which is what everybody in the Old Testament was preaching, which is what Moses was preaching, right? And it boggles my mind that I never saw this before. And I, I say this about myself jokingly. I felt real stupid because it's obviously called the promised land. So how did I not see that you can't work to get a promise? And so how did I not connect the two? I mean, I've read those verses a million times, right? How did I not see it? How did I not see Paul say, the only way to make a promise void is by trying to work to get it. <laughs> see, you know what Moses was telling those guys? Don't think you can work to get the promise. Don't think it's by your works that you're going to get the promised land. Don't think it's by your works that you're going to keep the promised land. Don't think that it's by your works that your kids will have the promised land. It's by the work of God. That's what Moses was telling them. That's the same thing Jesus is telling us. Don't think you can have life by the works of your own hands. Don't think you can inherit the kingdom by the works of your own hands. Don't think you can inherit the earth by the works of your own hands. You can only inherit those things by God giving it to you as a gift. Oh, you mean Moses and Jesus were saying the same thing? Yeah! <laughs> you know, Greg, you were talking 